Good morning, everyone. My name is Gordon Wallace, Deputy Chief with the Howard County Department of Fire and Rescue Services, located here in Central Maryland. Thank you all for being with us for the second annual Tenant Nathan Flynn Training Day. This year presented us with great challenges in preparing for this event. The training committee began meeting in the fall of 2019 with the intent of developing content and being able to offer hands-on training for our personnel. Unfortunately, the COVID-19 pandemic required us to adjust our plans. We had discussions about whether to postpone or even possibly cancel this event altogether. The committee decided to move forward in the training in order to fulfill, fulfill our goal of remembering Nate and the ultimate sacrifice that he made two years ago today. This event is a tribute to Nate's dedication and passion for training. Thank you all again for helping us honor and remember Lieutenant Nathan Flynn. Before we begin, a couple of messages. First, a message from Howard County Department of Fire and Rescue Chief William Anishewski. Good morning, and thank you for taking the time to join us for this virtual education moment. I'm Bill Anishewski, Fire Chief for Howard County Department of Fire and Rescue. The reason we are here for this session is near and dear to me for many reasons. First and foremost, Nate was one of ours. The loss of any firefighter is tough to take, but when it's one of yours, that cut is a little deeper. Second, I happen to be the acting fire chief the night of that fire, and going through that process was certainly the hardest thing I had to do in my career. But later that night, when I had some time to process, I made a promise that the loss of Nate would not be in vain. We, as a collective department, and the fire service in general, had to learn from this tragedy. We had to make adjustments in training and our policy, and we had to carry out the legacy of Nate. And this is why you were here. This is why the instructors of this course have committed themselves to share their experiences and what they learned from this so we all can improve. Today, one of the presenters you will hear from is Lieutenant Josh Burchick. Lieutenant Burchick was on the rapid intervention team on the night of that fire and made the grab of Nate. You will hear about the experiences of that team, the difficulties they faced and had to overcome, and what they learned from the future. You also hear the impact that day had on them. I am sure you will find this program informational. Take the pieces that you learn and share them throughout the fire service. Be a part in building that experience and learning bridge to gap those unknowns that are so deadly to us in the fire service. Another means that was near and dear to Nate, training. Again, thank you for joining us and I hope you enjoy the presentations today. Stay safe. Thank you, Chief Anishewski. And now we will hear from Celeste Flynn, Nate's wife. Celeste has been intimately involved in the ongoing development of the Nate Flynn Training Day mission and content. Hello. Hello. And welcome to the second annual Nate Flynn Fireground Leadership Training Day. For those of you that were with us last year, we're happy to see you back. Those of you that are new this year, we thank you for joining us and sincerely hope that you see this day as a valuable investment of your time and choose to keep this date on your training calendar year after year. I am Celeste Flynn. Nate was my husband and the father to our three young children, Tegan, Connor, and Brecken, as well as stepfather to my sons, Alex and Gavin. Nate died line of duty on July 23rd, 2018, after falling through the floor during an active basement fire. The idea for this training day started as we approached the one year anniversary last year and as a way to somehow control the feelings that we all had about that date. As you can imagine, July 23rd was a life altering day for me and the kids. It was a day that we shifted from fire service family to fire service survivors. I changed from fire wife to fire widow. Our lives went from being relatively private and shared with only our close circle of friends and family to being very public as we grieved alongside the department and many in the state and region. 
I had so many questions of my own and struggled to help the kids understand all that had happened while trying to hold it all together for the viewing and for the funeral. I haven't told many people this, but I spent the first few nights awake listening to the fireground audio over and over, listening to the mayday, trying to understand what went wrong and when. It probably wasn't the healthiest use of my time at that moment, but for some reason it felt like the right thing to do. I'd watched Nate listen to audio over the years and study many mayday calls. I knew for a fact that he would have been glued to his own trying to understand it. After the funeral, I asked to visit the scene. I needed to see the house and be able to appreciate the sheer size and scale of the operations that night. I needed to put a visual to the audio that I had spent so many hours studying. I walked through what was left of that house, retracing as many of Nate's last steps as I could. It was tough, I'm not gonna lie, but I knew I had to do it. And I say it was tough for me, but I know it was also tough for everyone there. I don't think they knew what to do with me and my list of questions. And I'm sure walking me through Woodscape, the rubble there that day, was the last thing Captain Matthews thought he'd be doing when he showed up for work that week. But he did it. And he and the rest of the team there with me that day patiently answered all of my questions. When I think back to that day now, I can clearly see how pivotal it was in getting us to where we are now and in kicking off the second annual training day. So while the actual plan for this program didn't start until last spring, the energy and the foundation behind this program really began that day in what was left of Woodscape. We all left that day with a different level of trust, respect, understanding, as well as the knowledge that we were committed to working together and communicating and collaborating as much as we could to do the best work possible for Nate. That all grew into a plan to turn July 23rd into something positive to honor the way Nate lived instead of just remembering that he was gone. Last year's training occurred just after the ISRB report was released. I shared with the group my feelings on six critical minutes in the timeline published in that report. These were the six minutes that passed from the point that Nate fell through the floor to the point that his air pack data showed significantly reduced respirations and no more movement. Lieutenant Burchick will share some views and data on air consumption in his material today. And while you're looking at that, I want you to know that Nate still had air in his tank. Nate also kept his mask on and sealed to his face. The discipline and willpower he showed in the final six minutes of his life will continue to amaze me. Last year, I asked all of you to think about those six minutes on a daily basis and how those six minutes changed Nate's life, his family's life, and the lives of so many others in the department. I also challenge you to find six minutes each day to do something to make you or your crew smarter, stronger, or more disciplined. And I hope that you took those six minutes as seriously as Nate did. And if you did, then I hope you feel good about the almost 40 extra hours that you invested in yourself or your craft over this last year. And I wish I could give you some kind of certificate or card for those hours, but I can't. So all I can do is offer my thanks for any number of the six minutes that you put in and for taking my challenge seriously. After all, you don't have to listen to me. I'm not qualified to tell you anything about the fire service or teach you anything about the fire service. I'm not a firefighter and I'm not a trainer. I'm just a fire widow. I'm someone that's been handed more than her fair share of folded flags someone that will never be able to hear Amazing Grace on bagpipes and not choke up. Someone that's way too familiar with ATF, NIOSH, CSST, ISRB, and far too many acronyms. I'm someone that got to unpack evidence bags with her husband's smoky t-shirt, socks, and underwear inside. I'm also someone that has her husband's charred helmet tucked away in a box in her closet. 
um, someone that's helped her kids trace her daddy's name from a granite wall and someone that's had to answer many questions about how or why daddy died. But I know that all of that fire widow experience makes me extremely qualified to be someone that doesn't want to see your name next to Nate's on any memorial wall. I don't want to see your spouse in my shoes. I'm someone that wants to keep the promise I made to my kids that we would do whatever we could to make sure other daddies and mommies go home safe. And that makes me someone that needs to promote and support training and knowledge as much, if not more, as a fire widow, as I did as a fire wife. Now, I'm not naive enough to believe that one class or one program or even 40 hours worth of six minutes are going to stop line of duty deaths. I'm just optimistic enough to hope that the work this team does and what you get out of the program stays with you and motivates you to keep your skills sharp and to go out and share your knowledge. A few weeks ago, I watched Alice in Wonderland with Tegan and near the end of the movie, the Caterpillar character Absalom says to Alice as she's crying, nothing is accomplished with tears. Nothing was ever accomplished with tears. So when Tegan hears this, she pauses the movie and turns to me and says, that's us, mommy, right? Just like you always tell us, it's okay to be sad, but it's not okay to stay sad. That we shouldn't just cry about a problem, that we should do something to make it better. Now, I'm sure I never said those exact words with the kids. I'm sure I said something more like, don't pout, work it out. But nevertheless, she gets it. And this training program is part of that something for me and for us. And when I hear that over 400 or 500 people or whatever the final number ends up being for today are registered for this class, it makes me feel like we are accomplishing something big. And I know that we have to be making some of it better. I'll close by saying, that while all of the memorials and engraved walls and bricks are beautiful, and I know that Nate would appreciate them all because of the strong love that he had for the honor and tradition and brotherhood that is part of the fire service, I am absolutely certain that he would be most proud and feel the most honor knowing that this training program exists and that you are all here today to take part of it. My continued gratitude goes out to the team that's behind all of this and my thanks for those of you in attendance. We'll see you next year. Bye. Bye. So getting started here, our first pre presenter will be Lieutenant Josh Burchick, Howard County Engine Company 7 A-Shift. Lieutenant Burchick is a 15-year veteran of the department and is known for his commitment to physical fitness and innovative training and company drills. Lieutenant Burchick was one of the officers leading the rescue efforts during Nate's May Day. Kind of starting from the top. Uh, the night on July 23rd, I'm gonna get right into it. <clears throat> we had a storm come through really early in the morning. Lightning strike uh, came through in this area and according to StrikeNet, at um, 1.20 in the morning, we had one lightning strike that produced 10 times more energy than any other lightning strike in the area. When it hit, it hit the mature uh, hardwood tree, ran the root system, it hit an underground propane tank, <clears throat> and then from there, ran the service lines into the structure. The C gas CSST line that you see there on the slide itself, that is an actual picture of the CSST line from the structure. And you can see the pinhole leak. Uh, that pinhole leak was created. It arced from the lightning strike, and we basically had a finger of flame from that pinhole that was re excuse me, resting up against the unprotected uh, dimensional lumber in the first floor space. So for the next 40 minutes, that little finger of flame was burning unchecked. And it wasn't until about 1.50 that just with the size of the structure, smoke started to present itself and it started waking up some of the residents in the home. So because they smelled smoke at 1.52, a, we, uh, Howard County Fire and Rescue, dispatched a local box. For us, that's two engines, a ladder, and a battalion chief. 
and it, they just got a visible smoke from the lightning strike. That's the only information that we have right now. So as the crews are coming down the street, uh, they are able to smell smoke from the house about 800 feet away. So they know they have something going on. Engine five one is the first due engine. Their on scene report says 51 to Howard. We have a single family two story smoke showing and go ahead and fill the full box. So that is gonna give you the, the greater compliment. So we have more engines two ladder trucks, another battalion safety officer, MDO, another medic unit. So we have a full box alarm coming now. Uh, while they're dispatching that full box alarm, a 51 does pull an attack line. They go to, or they speak with the owner to make sure everybody's out of the structure. And they deploy their line around the side Charlie. And I'll give you a view of that here in just a second. Uh, the homeowner does say that, they're, that the bulk of the smoke is in the basement. So they have that first cue right out the gate that they have smoke underneath of them. Uh, while this is going on, uh, 51 didn't initially make provisions for water supply. And we were going through some MD, MDT computer changes at the time where the battalion chief could see that there was a pole in the backyard. And that pole in the backyard was able to be accessed by 51. And 51 has a hydraulic driven submersible pump on the apparatus. Really cool piece of technology. They can drop this submersible pump into the pool. You, they can get 200 feet away with the hydraulic lines, and at the push of a button, they can hook up their LDH and get 500 GPM or greater straight to their engine. Uh, so they start working on that plan. Um, and none of the other units, because of the update that they had at the time, noticed that the pool was there. So that was a good call by the battalion chief in getting some type of water supply established. Now here's the structure. Obviously, this is not your standard two-story family, uh, single-family dwelling home. So this entire backside is side Charlie. From side Alpha, you can see that you have two stories. And this is where this concrete pad by the garage space, using the cursor here, that is where engine 51 ended up parking. Uh, 51 ran their submersible pump down this walkway. This walkway here is where a grade change occurs. So this is what caused a lot of confusion in the incident. Two stories from side Alpha, and underneath the gutter line, it still looks like you have two stories. However, this main level is all two stories, and then you have the third floor, the lowest level being uh, the basement, and you have at grade access. So above the roof line from side alpha, you can see that there are bedrooms, but this kept being called out as two stories and all of this being side Charlie with no real acknowledgement of the grade change. So as we get deeper into this incident, when units keep saying we're deploying here on side Charlie, we're deploying there, it causes a lot of confusion for the command officers and people that hadn't been able to see the structure yet about where the grade changes were, where people are actually going into, and if they say they're going in on this level, how are they still on the main level and not underneath in the basement? So that causes a lot of confusion. Now the main level is 7,300 square feet of finished living space. The basement was 1,100 square feet of finished living space. So right now you're looking at 8,400 square feet you know, your standard American home might be around 2,000 square feet. So you have multiple single family homes just within this one structure. Now underneath the main level, I'll show you a better picture here in a little bit. Underneath the main level, you have almost a 1,000 square foot, four to five foot tall crawl space. And that crawl space was unprotected. It was storage and it was again underneath the main level and it, was, it can only be accessed through the basement near the alpha wall. And that plays into a uh, large part of our operations. Okay, first in units, you have engine five one and tower 10. They entered the main floor through side Charlie on the upper side of the grade. Uh, right next to the garage, we have a laundry room. They deploy their lines into there. Thermal imaging cameras from three crew members noted that they had heat signatures below them. So denoting that we do have a fire in the basement. So they, backed out of the structure. Unfortunately, that information was never relayed over the radio or to command. So that was some good information that never got out to uh, responding units. Uh, Firefighter Flynn, excuse me, Lieutenant Flynn, um, pulled an additional attack line, a 300 foot attack line, and redeployed to the lower grade of side Charlie. Um, while uh, the Battalion Chief 1 aide was on the backside about to give his report, he assisted Flynn in line deployment and the crew from 51 also pulled an additional 200 foot attack line, which came up short while they're redeploying to side Charlie. So now crews realize there's something happened underneath of them. They're now going to the lower grade towards the uh, basement access. 
Now, as the box is being upgraded, as units are responding, here are some of the red flags that are sticking out. Uh, the 51 officer talked to the homeowner, said most of the smoke is in the basement. The battalion aide did his 360. He says that we do have access. We do have smoke in the basement. There are smoke conditions. He even got cut off by another unit and re, uh, re-aired his radio report, his 362 command. The tower 10 driver to the left of the front door, I have moderate smoke coming from the ground level. Uh, to me, that denotes a basement fire. If you have that nondescript smoke kind of coming from a little bit everywhere, especially from lower access points, that's a good indicator that you might have something underneath of you. Especially in an 8,400 square foot home, it's now being volume filled. It's going to take a while for that to get out. Um, Engine 51, the officer again, who had been reassigned as fire attack, uh, again confirming that they have smoke in the basement. I think there's a little conversation there about how much trouble they're actually having finding this fire. Um, but you're now almost an hour of burn time in at 2.15, and they talked about positive pressure. Uh, the Tower 10 officer, uh, when they went around to the backside, he says that they had made access to the basement. They do have zero visibility smoke conditions. Um, right around when this happened, the Engine 101 officer was coming around the upper grade of Side Charlie and said that they have fire showing on floor number one. So the crews hear this. They want to go back up to the upper grade of side Charlie. So the Tower 10 officer did a great job acknowledging where the units were, what units you have operating, what they're doing, and he's controlling the, uh, excuse me, the flow path. He's going to close the door back up, and he says the only crews that you should have are now entering side Charlie on the first level. Again, to the crews on the back side, it makes sense, but to the command officer, it's still causing a little bit of confusion because of that grade change. So engine 101's report, the officer, as she's coming around that upper grade of side Charlie, she sees in those two windows heavy fire, and that is probably the fire that had broken through the crawl space. It's now showing on the main level. So you have heavy f- fire on floor number one on side Charlie. So crews um, abandon their hose lines. Uh, Flynn pulls another 200 foot attack line off of engine 51, and he deploys through the laundry room side in that upper grade. Uh, engine 51 also deployed, redeployed their 200 foot hand line that initially had come up short. And again, that radio transmission was at 217. They had been on scene for 17 minutes, and you're just shy of one hour of now burn time in the structure. So I'm going to hit the pause button, and I'm going to let you know where uh, Seven's units and the remaining box alarm starts responding. So while all that's going on, um, we get dispatched, and just shy of us getting there at around 209, um, I knew I was going to be the next engine in, and I'm starting to think about water supply. Um, we could only make assumptions about what, where the lines had been laid for water supply um, because we missed the whole first half of the uh, box line of the transmissions on the upgrade. So engine 101, they had laid out a 100-foot section. They pulled into the driveway. They pulled some hose out to the main section on Woodscape Drive where you can see our engine is sitting. But prior to us even getting there, the one hydrant was at Berrywood Court. I'm familiar with this area. I knew that was going to be some of the best access for water. Um, but there was a confusion. The command officer thought that line had been laid all the way down Woodscape. And so they thought we were just completing a split leg, but that hadn't happened. And I hadn't seen hose in the street, so I'm confused about where, about what um, needs to happen. I thought I was going to split leg. Make a long story short, I ended up laying all the way in from Berrywood, down Guilford Road, down Woodscape Drive. I dumped an entire 1,000-foot hose bed, and we still came up 300 feet short. Um, engine 71 and the Engine 101 officer did a fantastic job making up that additional 300 feet in no time at all, and we never lost water supply. Once we had a positive pressure source, we were good to go for the remainder of the incident. Uh, so we arrived with Truck 7. We're housed together. We got on scene about the same time. We were initially assigned to go through the interior on site out of the main entrance. Uh, to try to find some fire. Right as we're getting ready to go in, the command officer realizes that things aren't progressing the way they should be. There's a lot of unknowns and there's a lot of conflicting information. So he radios back to Seven's unit. She's like, you know what, 71, hold up right there. Don't go in, you're on deck. So that just means we're in a ready forward position. We're not going interior. And so I use that time to open up the door, scan through the front foyer to see if I could get any sign of it, any indication of what was going on. Um, I didn't see any pressurized heat sources. I didn't see any, any idea of where there could be fire underneath of us, around us. It was just 
uh, zero signs showing up on my camera. A lot of that we found out was um, just some false signs the tick was giving us. So there had been multiple layers of subflooring that was underneath of a, a thick imported Italian tile. And that insulated it enough to where those signs never showed through. So we would have been going over top of the, the basement fire and we would have not known because the camera could not pick that up because it was being insulated so well. So fortunate for us and the command officer making a good decision and saving our butts, uh, we, were, we were protected that night. Um, truck 7 was formally assigned writ. We hadn't been assigned yet. So uh, that gave me a time to kind of step back, look. I'm seeing that brown smoke pushing from the eaves. It's telling me that it's burning into the structural components now. It's also being volume filled. It's filling up a, a, an 8,400 square foot mansion. And there was just this eerie silence that came throughout the fire ground. Okay, so that's the mayday that we hear about one minute and 45 seconds after engines in truck seven arrived on location. Uh, we had very little time. We only had that minute and 45 seconds to gather tools, gather equipment. Um, we hadn't had uh, our own 360 done. So the engine 101 officer gets her mayday out. Uh, the firefighter Flynn on Bravo 2 gives his own mayday. He does a very good job, consistent with our training, gives out a clear who, what, where. Uh, the unfortunate side of this is because he was on Bravo 2 at the same time that the engine 101 officer gave her mayday, the messages got trumped over each other. So we only heard the 101 officer. Fighter fire, excuse me, firefighter Flins was not heard on the fire ground. It was not heard in the communication center until after this fire was over. Uh, we were going through some radio changes at the time where we had a last channel power up feature. It didn't matter what you did with the buttons, whatever the last channel you were on. Uh, that's the channel that you would be brought up on when you powered up the radio, no matter what you did. So I can only assume, but I know that I've done it plenty of times uh, during this time period, is Alpha 2 is our main response channel for medicals and fire, excuse me, fire alarms and car wrecks. So he was probably on Alpha 2 from a medical or a car wreck earlier in the day, and when he switched over to the Bravo Tax channel, he was still on the 2 zone. So he probably... Um, it's just an honest mistake that I know I've done. And since we have uh, rectified that issue and we have made some changes and we're still going through some, some changes so that this doesn't happen again. But it was missed, um, but he did exactly what he was trained to do. So the mayday is now sounded. Um, and we do realize, um, according to the Charlie command, that firefighter Flynn did fall through the floor. He's, he went down the hose line. He's not being able to get pulled back up. And he is one floor below grade level. So again, indicating that he's probably in the basement. So here's a rough timeline of just the writ operation during the actual mayday. So Flynn gave out his mayday. We had formally been assigned writ with truck seven. And again, we only had one minute and 45 seconds of actually being on scene to gather our tools, to get a plan together and get ready to make entry. Um, you can see just a couple minutes later that Flynn's temperature alarm on his BA was activated there was a noticeable de decrease in air consumption about six minutes in, and that's what uh, his wife Celeste mentioned earlier. He had six minutes to stay disciplined, to get out his hue aware, to get out his mayday message. He kept all of his gear on, and I'll talk about that here in a minute. Um, from the time that the mayday message was actually sounded to the time that he was being extricated from the structure, we had him out in 22 minutes and 11 seconds, which is and from the time we were actually allowed to make entry was 15 minutes and five seconds. And keep in mind, this is in an 8,400 square foot home. So here's a better uh, picture of side Charlie. When the Mayday message happened, the truck seven officer and I had a quick conversation. He was gonna go around the Bravo wall. I was gonna go around the Delta wall. That way we could put the 360 picture together and not both waste time, both making our own 360s. So we would meet around on the backside, put the picture together, put a plan together, while that was happening, uh, my crew on 71, they had a charged 300 foot attack line. They redeployed that around side Delta and had it ready and waiting by the time I was around on the backside. So we found our entry point. Again, this is the lower level of side Charlie. 
and these are all French doors that we made access in eventually. When we got around to the back side, there's this little bump out. We did have fire showing underneath a little bit of a crawl space underneath that bump out. So we knew that we had a, a working fire. We knew that there was fire in that void space in between the basement and the first floor. Now here's a basic sketch of the basement. Um, you can see here that underneath the main level, this is where the crawl space is. In between the or excuse me, the crawl space was split into two, so almost 1,000 square feet split into two, and there was one little doorway just connecting both sides of the crawl space. When Nate fell into the hole, um, he was able to move down that wall, and fortunately we found him right in that doorway. But you'll notice that to make access, we had to go from side alpha all the way around side delta, through Charlie all the way back to alpha, through a storage room, and then into the crawl space to find him. So we had uh, quite the search ahead of us. Also pay attention to this first set of stairs. Um, I'll get into that here in just a second. Uh, when we went in, we were also being held up for a couple minutes. At the time, there were par reports of other missing firefighters. So there was about four minutes while we were ready and in a forward position ready to be deployed, but we had to get par reports because there were reports of two to three other missing firefighters from some of the first in units. Once those personnel where we accounted for and we had a positive identification that it was Flynn that fell through the floor um, that's when we were able to get the green light and go in so that first set of steps we go in and the only thing that you hear is regulators being clipped into masks uh, I applaud my crew they were incredibly disciplined and it was not a situation where I was sitting there having to bark orders they knew exactly what the expectation was. They knew what their responsibilities were. And everybody clipped in and we just single filed into the basement. As we were going in, I realized that I probably shouldn't be leading this stack. Things are rapidly evolving. So I actually hung back for a second and used my camera to get a general idea of mapping the room and see where my guys were going to see where the units were. We're taking one hand line in with us. We had some miscellaneous hand tools and that was really it. So seven of us go in, the truck crew, let me back up. That first set of steps, this goes to the main level. Members of the truck crew went up that first set of steps and they got to the top of it. And as they waved their hand across the, that top landing, he, he said it felt like his arm was gonna melt off. The heat was super intense and they were, we just knew we couldn't access it. So they came back down and gave that message to the officers and we continued to file through. This picture on the left, this is a fireplace room, tons of furniture, a lot of, lot of uh, space for entertaining. There's a bar, and we're just met with zero visibility conditions. No real heat, but we can't see anything. There's a lot of tile. Just from that t thick, tarry smoke, it's getting really slick. And we're just having to navigate our people and the hose line through all this furniture and all this, this entertaining area of the, of the finished basement. Um, as we're going from Charlie back to side alpha through this basement, one of the members says, hey, we found a set of steps. And for some reason, that was a green light for all of us. We knew that this was going to get us somewhere where we needed to be. Um, so we cut through a small storage room area, and we find this half set of steps. And that's the picture on the right. Um, we knew it was only half set of steps, and we didn't really know at the time that this was a crawl space. We didn't know what we were getting into. Um, but we make access to the top of it. Now, here's a video taken by Engine 51's driver. It's about 2.29. So this is two minutes and 16 seconds after Rit actually entered the basement. And it's about 10 minutes prior to us actually making contact with Firefighter Flynn. And this is information that we were able to gain from SCBA data and radio transmissions and kind of eyewitness accounts. So we think we have some pretty accurate time statements. But this video is giving you an idea of the smoke conditions from the exterior and what they look like and give you an idea of the, the conditions that we're actually going into. And this is probably just prior to us actually making the crawl space. Okay, so that video gives you a pretty good indication of what we're, the conditions that we're encountering. Um, it's, being, it's definitely volume filled. We've filled up that entire structure with smoke. Um, it's that black, tarry, nasty, angry smoke. It's starting to become over, it's starting to get a little bit more velocity behind it from when we first got on scene, so now it's being heat pushed. 
um, it's getting turbulent. So this is telling me, hey, you know, this we're starting to work towards that those flashover conditions. Um, and those are that's basically the conditions that we were met with as we're getting into that crawl space. Um, and keep in mind, no water had been uh, put on this fire at all up until this point, and we're now looking at one hour and ten minutes of burn time uh, in this incident. So we get to the top of the steps. These are the conditions that we're met with. And I'm going to kick this over to firefighter uh, Joey Alessandrini. Uh, we endearly call him Drini because we're super creative in the fire service. We just chop off half of his name and we call him Drini. Um, he's got a really good message. He's going to set the story up for us, and then I'm going to uh, add in here. Took the line up the steps, and this is where we were actually met with the most heat and the most fire. Um, I just kept the nozzle open pretty much the whole time. I had fire to the left of me, in the front of me, and to the right. Um, kind of just making my way up the steps. Um, and uh, I remember it was Lieutenant Birchick tapped me on my shoulder and said, hey, we got fire over the, the back of your uh, right shoulder here. And uh, this is where I went to move the nozzle to the right and I couldn't. Um, I didn't know what was kind of going on at the time. I, I just know I couldn't move the nozzle, you know, from in front of me to the right of me. I uh, kind of reached up to feel and I felt wires along the nozzle and as I moved forward to free the nozzle I realized that I couldn't move myself. I was entangled. Um, <clears throat> I remember just, you know, I, Lieutenant Burchick was still there and I said, hey, I'm, you know, I'm tangled. I cannot move. And, you know, calm, cool, collected, he, he got out his cutters and uh, he freed me. And um, at, around this time, Captain Love, the uh, truck captain, also became entangled in wires, and uh, he was also he was also freed. Um, just an eerie feeling. Uh, we do a lot of uh, <laughs> we do a lot of training. You know, until you're in that situation, it's 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 a scary feeling. I was just very blessed to have the crew that we had that night. Uh, the youngest guy on our crew that night was, you know, ten years on the job. Uh, we were all very <coughs> trained and aware of one of the want to aware of each other and what we're capable of and uh, it's just the eerie feeling and like I said I was just so lucky to be with the crew that I had that night um, <clears throat> as we advanced up these stairs uh, firefighter Andy Hoffman who was riding in the C position on engine 7 one that night um, so we got him. Uh, he had found Lieutenant Flynn, and uh, then the crews from Engine Seven and Truck Seven uh, went at, went up, got him, pulled him out, and uh, that's when Captain Love from Truck Seven made the radio communication that we got him. We're bringing him out. Um, I remember them, you know bringing uh, Lieutenant Flynn out next to me, and uh, I was just still on the nozzle. Um, I didn't want to leave that position just because of the high heat, the flames, the visibility, and uh, they got him out. Okay, Drini does a great job setting up the story and setting up what we're getting into, and I'm gonna kind of break it apart a little bit more. So he's an incredibly humble person and um, he did a fantastic job and he says he remained dedicated to his position. It's very easy to be a moth of flame, no pun intended, or work on the rescue side of things, but he was disciplined enough to stay in his position and keep that fire in check. So as we got to the top of the steps, um, we slid in, immediately met with just a wall of black and some, some fairly high heat. It was that heat that would drive you to your knees so we knew it was ugly. Um, 
Drini starts, you know, squirting what water he can, and that's the first water that had been deployed on the water, or excuse me, on the fire through the incident. So now we're looking well over an hour of burn time, and that's the first water that's being deployed. When we hit the top of the steps, I could hear Nate's pass device in front of us. I said, hey, Cap, he's, he's somewhere right in front of us. You know, let's try to go get him. And it was a blessing and a curse. I don't know if it's, it's probably because of the hole in the structure. Sometimes the smoke would lift and the fire would build and it gave us enough light to see. And other times it would be back to a wall of black and we couldn't see anything and the heat would drive up. And other times the heat would lift. Um, but Drini starts to knock down the fire and I start to slide up. As I do, as I try to get towards the sound of the pass device, I could just feel wires pull across my chest. And I didn't feel like I was in any immediate danger. There wasn't this, uh, I wasn't necessarily tangled. And I thought about doing a swim technique to get underneath these wires. And I thought to myself, if we have to get Nate and drag him back through this, this is gonna be just mayhem. So I start clipping some of the wires and uh, take my wire cutters out to clipping the wires and try to free that path so we can actually get through. Um, as I get that undone, the fire starts kicking up again. I'm seeing things on either side of us. Um, and just to speak on what's in the crawl space, there's catering equipment, tables, chairs, Costco size catering equipment for, you know, close to 60 people. There's holiday decorations all throughout. There are some abandoned oil tanks down there. Um, and we're in a <clears throat> block foundation where we can't even get radio transmissions out. So the heat and the fire starts to build again. And I say, hey, Drini, you got to get this knocked down. It's starting to get ugly. And um, I want you to be so calm that you call your friend and your officer, bro. Um, I just see him hunched over the nozzle, kind of in odd position. I say, uh, you know, get this knocked down, man, it's getting bad. And he goes, bro, I'm stuck. And the nozzle's stuck. And I could just see wires start to wrap around him. So I clip away the wires around him and what had been uh, somehow gotten itself wrapped around the bell of the nozzle. He couldn't even open it. So we get that opened up. He's able to start knocking down wires again. Um, right as Drini gets free, he's starting to squirt water. The captain's helmet falls off and he starts coming kind of into the area that we were at. And I just with a little bit of flame and light that we had, I could see wires start to wrap around his torso. So I start to free him away as well. And then one of the truck firefighters, uh, Mun Yuen, slid up and he's like, hey, man, I see what's going on. I got you. I can help you. You do your thing. So he continues to, to clear the wires out on our exit path. And just now Drini was able to squirt water, keep the fire in check. But I was still so worried about just these rapidly escalating conditions and things degrading around us. I was like, I'm worried about this thing flashing. I don't know where the fire is. I want you to single stack on the steps because if we have to bail, I'm really worried about hitting just a wall of bodies that are sitting there at the top of the steps. So they were single stack. They were ready in case we did have to bail just because I was worried about that. In that meantime, the backup firefighter, Andy Hoffman, was behind me. And I, I joked that he was like a caged tiger. Um, he slid up as soon as the wires were cleared and he was the first one to Flynn. And Andy was ready. He had his um, buddy breathing line out in case there needed to be some type of air exchange. He found Flynn kind of slightly face down on his side in that doorway that split the two pieces of the crawl space together. So he was able to resituate Flynn, and Flynn had his mask still on. He had his gear still on. He, he had a glove off, but that was it. He still had air in his face piece. So in one of the worst situations in your life, he was disciplined enough to actually keep all of his gear on and Andy was prepared to do that air exchange. Um, I slid up to him. I had my Halligan bar and cutters, and I needed the free hand. So I dropped my tools, and we grab a shoulder, uh, each grab a shoulder strap. We're on all fours, and we each have a shoulder strap, and we're getting ready to drag him out. And we try to pull, and he doesn't go anywhere. And I look over at Andy and I said, hey, we need to do like a, a coordinated effort. So let's do one, two, three, pull. And he actually starts to move. One, two, three, pull. One, two, three, pull. And little by little, we're getting out of this structure. We're still tripping up. We have just this little tiny narrow pathway to walk through. And um, we finally drag him. We're, we're estimating about 30 feet through that tight hallway, through the crawl space, back to the top of the steps. Now, looking back at this slide, the sides are labeled incorrectly, and it's not exactly to scale. And obviously there's a lot more stuff that we have to navigate, but this is the general path. You can see where the, uh, the crawl space is split in two. This is where we found them, and we're getting back out to the top of the steps. Go ahead, Rich. We got a firefighter Flynn. He's getting 
Excuse me, that was the first radio transmission that our captain was able to get out. He was our eyes and ears. He was making sure that everybody was safe. He was keeping track of units. And because we're basically in an underground block room, that was the first transmission he was able to get out once we got to the, back to the top of the steps. Once myself and Andy got to the top of the steps, we handed him off to the waiting truck crew. And Carlos Bound did a great job of getting him from the top of the steps, down the steps, through the storage room, and through about half of the basement. Um, that's a right around the same time as we're exiting the crawl space that our lower air alarms start going off. So we're so immersed in our work that we're not tracking air. And that was our first indicator, like we are, we're getting on the back end of our air supply. We need to get out of here. Now, fortunately, we had a rough idea of where we, we needed to go. Uh, we had our hose line to direct us. And um, while we were doing our work in the RIT operation, the secondary RIT team had did a fantastic job of clearing the basement of the furniture and setting up spotlights so we had a beacon. And as soon as we got out of the crawl space in the main part of the basement, we could see that beacon of light. We knew exactly where we needed to go. Um, because that we were all working within 100% of our capacity, we were just completely physically and mentally exhausted. So when the truck firefighter laid him down, I tried to pick Nate back up and try to drag him out the rest of the way and he didn't budge. I was too physically exhausted. And I think we were just, we were just on the back end of our you know, physical ability. <clears throat> so a member from the secondary red team said, hey, I, I gotcha. Grabbed him, drug him out the rest of the way and passed him on to, his, to the awaiting, uh, excuse me, to the awaiting EMS crew, which happened to be his own crew from station 10, paramedic 105. His own people, his own peers, his own teammates, were the ones that had to provide care for him. And they immediately went to work getting him undressed and getting him on the stretcher and getting the ALS skills underway. And other paramedics on the scene jumped in and also did an incredible job trying to help him out. Uh, we came out of the structure, we dressed down. We could still see fire showing in that little plenum space underneath that little bump out on the backside. And so we continued to kind of knock that down a little bit. We passed that job task off to somebody else and we just dressed down and we go to the uh, backside of the yard by the pool. We all kind of gathered around. We said a quick prayer, and um, we just waited. They're estimating that within one to two minutes, according to some eyewitness reports and to some of the burn data that we're finding, that within one to two minutes of engine and truck seven exiting that crawl space, the rest of the crawl space that we were in collapsed. So just let that sink in for a minute. Um, if our backup guy had not pulled and navigated every single one of those turns, every piece of furniture the right way. It's estimated that we only had about 10 to 15 feet of line left with that 300 foot line that was started on side alpha, wrapped around one whole side, went all the way through the structure and into the crawl space. So we could, we may not have had the hose line. If we had wasted time and didn't navigate turns properly, if we had spent more time um, in the crawl space, dealing with an entanglement scenario. If we didn't have the physical strength and capacity to get him out as quickly as we did, um, we could have been in that crawl space for one to two minutes longer, no problem. So just let that sink in and how you can coordinate your training and how you manage those inefficiencies during your training. It absolutely paid off for us that evening. Now I'm gonna switch gears a little bit. Um, I'm gonna kind of show some relations and parallels between what we're finding in the American Fire Service. So Project Mayday is a fantastic resource. Um, last year, at the time when I was researching this, there was almost 5,000 incidents on the career side of this data that we were able to pull that gave us some good clear numbers. So what we're looking at here on the left-hand side is Howard County Fire and Rescue and our incident. And Project Mayday, this is some of the data that they're finding for um, Mayday and RID operations. Now, when I go through this, this does not mean causation. Okay, this just means that if you're a command officer, or maybe you're a first arriving officer, that there are some things that might be happening in the background. There's some data that shows you that the cards might be stacked against you. So it doesn't mean that you're destined for this to happen, but it gives you some greater awareness that, hey, if I'm in a similar scenario, I need to be more mindful of these things that are happening. 
So the number one size department that a Mayday happens with is that two to 500 personnel range, and we're at 500 personnel. Uh, the number one time frame of when a Mayday occurs is between 1 and 3 a.m., and ours happened. We were dispatched at 1.52, and the Mayday occurred at 2.20, which is 28 minutes after the dispatch, which is also the number one time frame. Maydays usually occur within 25 to 30 minutes of the incident start. Uh, the Mayday firefighters are, were from the second engine, while they were in with the first engine, 83% of the time, it's the first or second engine. And engine 101 that evening was a three-person engine company and 41%, again, the number one occurrence is with the three-person engine company. So uh, fortunately now, all Howard County units are staffed with four personnel, but at the time there were still a couple units that were staffed with three. <clears throat> now looking at the actual RID operation, we, um, ready response for the American Fire Service is just shy of three minutes. We had one minute and 45 seconds from the time the Mayday sounded to gather a plan and get our equipment. Mayday at Rinitri, you're looking at seven minutes. <clears throat> Excuse me, their average, they're looking at three. Keep in mind, four minutes of that, we're physically being held up, told we cannot go in until we get a better PAR report of where these other missing firefighters were. So when you take that four minutes away, yeah, we're right there at that three minute mark. By the time we actually contacted the downed firefighter, according to SCBA data, it was 12 minutes. Um, f uh, it's almost six minutes for the national average. Total time inside, again, from the time we were allowed to go inside to the time we had him out, it was 15 minutes and five seconds, and 22 minutes and 11 seconds total from the time that Mayday was sounded to the time we had him out. Um, it's common for uh, three, or excuse me, one in five firefighters experienced a Mayday. We had three of ours with the entanglement scenario and it takes 12 firefighters to rescue one. We've heard all kinds of data, depending if it's Phoenix, wherever, 15, 17, they're finding 12. It took seven to rescue Flynn. And this was all done in an 8,400 square foot home in advanced fire conditions. So some of the other things they're finding is 20% of Mayday's the number two cause is being lost and separated from your hose line. Um, and falls, in, excuse me, falls into the basement is the number two reason for a Mayday. 62% uh, of entanglement issues are for wire and duct work. 68% of personnel do have a cutter on them to affect some type of self-rescue. So that means one out of three firefighters don't have the right tool to get themselves out of a bad situation. And those other two out of three, do they have the right tool to actually get them out of a bad situation? And a RIC company uses 21% more air than a typical on-scene engine company. So again, these don't necessarily mean causation, but there's a lot of really great free data out there where you can draw some parallels to what your department might be doing and you can just compare, compare it to yourselves and learn and grow and design training around that. All right, I'm gonna switch gears a little bit. <clears throat> um, I could spend another two hours presenting on what it's like to have to deal with the line of duty death from the time you hear that Nate Flynn passed, going to the hospital, going back home, having your first shift back, and the next days, weeks, years, about the decisions you're gonna to have to make, about the questions you never thought you'd have to ask, about the feelings and emotions that you're gonna come with. Um, when I walked into the firehouse coming back from the hospital that evening, or excuse me, that morning, recruit class 31, it was our first day on the job. So had it been just 12 hours earlier, it could have been a recruit's first day in the field on that call, on that incident. And I didn't know what to say to him. Um, Three of them looked at me wide-eyed, and I said, guys, I'm, I'm just being truthful. We're gonna need a little bit of patience from you because we gotta work through this, and just please bear with us. Uh, I didn't have the words. I didn't know what type of you know, motivating leadership talk I could give them when we're coming from the incident scene and dealing with one of our own that had just passed. So then I come home. This picture on the right is uh, of my two girls. I endearly call them my feral children. Um, I come home in there, it's obviously summertime, so they're not in school, they're in princess dresses, the house is a mess, and my wife had already kind of prompted them about what had happened. So I come through the door, and my youngest daughter, you know, obviously I'm upset, I've been crying, and she looks at me and goes, Dad, are you okay? And I'm trying to kind of hold back tears, I said, yeah, babe, I'll be okay. And she kind of cocks her head, and she's like, well, he doesn't look okay, but apparently that satisfied her question, and she goes, Daddy? I said, yeah, babe. Uh, can I have cereal? And so it made me laugh. I, uh, it kind of gave me a little bit of decompression time for a minute there. And then I look at my other daughter, Harper, and Harper says, um, 
Um, Daddy, is your friend hurt? <clears throat> I said, yeah, baby, he's hurt. He's not going to make it home. And, um, you know, just that five-year-old mind, I guess it satisfied her question, too. And she goes, Daddy, I said, yeah. And I just, I can only think about what's about to come. She goes, hey, you're standing in the way of the TV. And so, again, I just kind of laugh. They're, they're sweet children. And I had to go from a firefighter who just lost his academy teammate and I had to go into dad mode. And my wife was incredible, super supportive. She helped out so much and she was my shoulder, but I still have two young daughters to deal with at home and still be the dad and still be that strong presence. Exactly one week later from the day Nate died, the picture on the left is uh, my daughter Harper's, uh, it was her fifth birthday. And both sides of our family get along really well. Everybody's there to celebrate her birthday. We're cooking out, everybody's in the kitchen. And I look around and I see the, our family getting along and they're happy. And I had this overwhelming sense of guilt from, I get to enjoy this time with my family. And Celeste is at home with her five kids without a husband, without a father. And then that survivor's guilt crept in. And I just broke down in my kitchen. And I went upstairs, had a good cry, <laughs> washed my face, came back down and Everybody was so engrossed in their conversation, they were none the wiser. And nobody knew about that story until about a year later when I told my wife. Um, so it was just weird. You're going to have all these emotions and things that hit. Again, I could go on for hours about all these little stories like that. 72 hours later, I had to go back on shift. And when you kiss your wife goodbye that next morning, that kiss was different. That hug was different. And you go back in. And you talked to your shift members that morning, and it was awesome. We knew exactly what we had to do. We checked our BA. We did training. We did everything to make it as normal as possible, and then we all sat down in the kitchen, and we just talked. And it was one of the most therapeutic things you could do to be with the people that you just experienced that with. And it was just, it was super awesome. Um, but again, that was just a little, just a little insight, a little glimpse into some of the things that we were going through. And again, I could go on for absolute hours about some of the things that you never thought you would have to think about and decisions you never thought you would have to make when you're going through this scenario. So now I'm going to switch gears again. We're going to get into the back third of this. And I say this was a semi-successful operation. We weren't able to bring Flynn back as much as we wanted to, as much as we could. We can't bring him back, but we were able to save ourselves. We were able to get him out and um, in some really crazy scenarios. So in my mind, it was semi-successful, and I'm gonna kind of break it down about some of the things that led us to where we were at that point and how we were able to get ourselves out. So some of the intangibles, engine and truck seven. We had probably at the time close to 170 years worth of experience with these crew members. Uh, Broji, he was, uh, just got off recruit status. He had one year in in Howard County, but he had volunteer time, and he was incredibly dedicated to his craft and, prof and the, our profession. And he was detailed the night. I saw him on scene. I grabbed him. He came with me, and he was the backup guy. So he was the one managing that line and make sure we had every inch that we had and we needed. But everybody else here had at least 10 years on the job. Um, we have spent countless hours together training sitting around the coffee table, having conversations. You know, we trusted each other. Um, even outside the firehouse, sometimes we'll have shift parties. Our wives know each other, our kids play together. So when you read NASH reports and you hear about people acting out of their position, or you have a lot of details in or out, you have people on 48 hours of overtime and they're fatigued, we didn't have any of that at play. The crew integrity was such an important piece. The experience of our crews was such an important piece. And that's a fact that can't be understated. It's very easy to look over that, and I absolutely understand that there are staffing issues, there are budget issues, there's just logistics of sick calls. If you're in a volunteer company, you might have just duty crews, but you cannot put a price on the people that you work around and who you have to trust. Now, getting into some training, um, the audio doesn't work really well for this, but you see some flashing lights. We're going to get into the trading side of this. What's happening here is we've taken contractor bags and we've blacked out the windows in the engine bay. We've set up two sheets of plywood on either side of a forcible entry prop. And I set up the scenario where two firefighters are in a below grade, like a walk-up style basement. There's a working house fire and there's people trapped. 
and the engine company is behind you waiting for you to force this door. And in low visibility conditions, under stress, I make them do push-ups and sit-ups, and we go into um, the actual scenario so their heart rate's up, their breathing rate is up, and they have to force inward and outward swinging doors with another person, and then they have to do it again right back to back while on air in full gear by themselves. Now, this is the back end of training. It would not be fair to me, and it would not set ourselves up for success if this was day one of training. This is the final end culmination of, of hours and hours and weeks worth of training. And I think what I'm trying to get at is that it's very easy to start with the really cool, sexy things, things that we see on the videos from other departments, and these really grandiose scenarios where we need to start with the basics, and I'm gonna start picking that apart a little bit. Now I'm gonna set this video up. Uh, this is a uh, video from a fire company just north of us. They went through, this is a one minute video. They had issues with their engine. They were having some pump issues. And so they had to wait for another company to come. They have a working house fire. It's a two story split level home. So you can see the fire on the upper level of the split. And I'm gonna kind of break apart what happens here. So here's a quick one minute uh, video. All right, so that's an exact one minute clip. So what you hear is you're on the upper level of split, you're in the hallway that splits off into bedrooms, they're fighting fire, and you hear one firefighter start to scream because that firefighter falls into the hallway down to his waist because some of the floor had given way. Um, he's, he's screaming, he's getting burned up. He ended up having to deal with some burn injuries, but he ended up being okay. Uh, but he got drugged out by another firefighter there. And what I want you to focus on is that another firefighter yells, mayday, mayday, mayday. He does it again. He looks right at the other firefighter where the camera was and says, mayday, mayday, mayday. And I'm not knocking him. I'm not, I don't mean to money my quarterback. They had a conversation after the fact when they were able to pull the video. It was like, you got your mayday out. You did great. You know, what happened? And he said that we sit around the coffee table or, you know, we talk about mayday scenarios. We do these tabletops. We, I got the mayday out but I haven't actually trained to where I actually have to reach my hand up, key up my mic, and do that physical gross motor skill process of keying up the mic and actually saying mayday, mayday, mayday in a stressful situation. So this was a huge light that went off in my head. I've been doing training where I'm using wrench channels where I don't get the uh, chirp feedback, or maybe I'm not using a real tack channel during my training, and I can see firefighters key up and key up and wait for that feedback, wait for that chirp. And I realized that I'm starting to ingrain some things in their muscle memory that they shouldn't, they shouldn't be there. So this was a, a big eye-opening experience for me, just learning from others and saying, hey, I need to change the way I'm doing training. And so we're going to now roll into how we can actually do that. So we're going to get into that kind of crawl, walk, run methodology. So no matter what training we're doing, we start with the absolute basics. What's the goal here? Um, if it's doing SCBA confidence, we're not going to be in gear. We're not going to get stressed out yet. We're just going to work gross motor skills in doing air exchanges and making sure you're going to the right pockets to get the right tool that you need. And then over time, we can start building on that. So we have to start with the fundamentals. And throughout, we need to have very clear expectations of this is what we're trying to accomplish. This is the process that we're going to use to get there. And this is going to hopefully be the final end result. And if on the way there, we find a better way, even better. I don't want to be limited 
I don't want to be so confined to these processes that we miss out on the progress side of things and finding new ways of, and better ways of doing things. But we need to have some very clear expectations and work those fundamentals and constantly go back to them. And we can't move on and move forward until those absolute fundamentals are second nature. And once we do that, then we can start putting gear on. Then we can start adding more stress, whether it be running, doing push-ups, doing sledge swings on a tire, making it more reminiscent, pulling hose, crawling around. Then we can take vision away, making sure the air bottle's on to make this as real as possible. The first time I want you to experience this should not be on the fire ground. I want you to do it here. And we just have to be very careful. You are probably gonna have people that have that range with experiences. And I've had people that say, hey, why aren't we doing it this way? You know, we should be doing this. And you see the younger firefighters or maybe the 30 year firefighter who hasn't been keeping up with their skills and their eyes glass over, say, no, we need to start from the very beginning and you, you, I need you to be patient and we have to do this all together. So we also need to stay away from, the, the, from some of the craziness. I want you to stress, I want you to experience failure. I don't need five townhouses on fire with a, and then a plane crashes in the backyard. And I've experienced those too, and you lose sight of people and you lose the realism. But to actually stress people out, that should be some of the end goal. And there's that saying, slow is smooth and smooth is fast. Over time, our slow is kind of in quotes. We start to become faster. We can build complexity. And our slow and our smooth, it actually becomes quite fast. And that's where that difference between haste and speediness comes in. We need to be aggressive. Um, I would expect that of somebody trying to help my family out in a bad situation. Um, but we don't want to be so hasty that we're missing out on steps. So we need to be very clear with what expectations we're taking and what process we're taking through our actual training. Um, yeah, it's a great quote. You want to know how to build morale? You do hard things. And <clears throat> I've seen when I've conducted training, maybe somebody who hasn't kept up with their skills, they put a mask on. I've seen people freak out in their mask when you block out their vision, they have to do a very simple search drill in the day room of the firehouse. Um, people get tangled up the first time in the entanglement prop when there's no gear on them and no SCBA, they're not breathing air and they start to thrash around in the entanglement prop, their low air alarm goes off and they realize I only have a couple minutes left of air and you can see the hands start to shake. You can see the heart rate get up. You can see the stress start to mount. And we need to make sure that we build those skills up on the front end, but they also need to experience this hardship. So struggle is okay. Struggle is a good thing once you've developed the skills to actually get there. And once you get there, uh, elite teams like the Navy SEALs stress their personnel out so much that they want to experience a little bit of failure. And I feel like we need to do the same thing. So once you actually get to experience that failure, once you get to a real emergency incident, a real emergency scenario out on the street, that should be easier than some of your training. And that's the goal. And you hear that a lot in special teams and elite teams. You can even be sports teams if we're getting out of public safety where the incident itself was easier than the training they put themselves through. And that could be some of the inside goals of this. And that's what we want to work towards. Now, once we do get to that backside, stress inoculation, this is a huge piece. There is a difference between physical stress, like working out and exercising, and the mental, emotional, adrenaline induced side of stress. They don't equate in a lot of times in these situations. So a lot of times when you get to the 145 beats per minute, a lot of the research shows that you are gonna have a significant breakdown in your performance and your fine motor skills go out the way, or excuse me, go out the door. You're gonna to start to get auditory exclusion. You're starting to get tunnel vision. You lose those fine motor skills. And the only way that you can combat that from happening is by actually training in those environments and forcibly stressing yourselves out and putting yourselves in that situation. So moving on, here's kind of like a little a bit of the bell curve here that we see with stress and performance. So we need to start with very simple skills. We need to build on that. And you will, they've started to notice like right around 115 beats per minute, that's when your fine motor skills start to deteriorate. Um, 115 to 145, that's kind of like the optimal side of your adrenaline induced response. That's where the optimal survival comes in with complex motor skills vasoconstriction, getting that tunnel vision squared away to where you're actually channeling it for good. Once you get above 145, that's when that starts to break down. The only way you can combat that is if you've actually been in that situation before and if you've trained for it. So once you get above 145, that condition gray that you see, that's where you can be a force for good. But the first time you experience that cannot be on the fire ground. You have to have been there before. 
Once you get above 175, that's condition black. And for a lot of people, research has shown, especially for public safety, uh, military and police especially, once they get that adrenaline-induced response at 175 or higher, it's basically shut down. Um, people have actually literally defecated themselves in stressful situations because they lose bodily control. So as much as we can, we need to fight that as much as possible. And we can relate that back to what happened at Woodscape. As my crew, we had trained for insanguine scenarios. We had trained physically um, to be, make sure our bodies were prepared for that. We had been in gear. We had had limited ranges of motion. We had stressed ourselves out to the point to where we had experienced those situations before. So for us, we kind of got in this flow state. And there's actually a lot of research behind the flow state and flow theory. Um, I related to like an awesome rock band in their jam session, or like you see sports teams in really hard situations and they just execute flawless moves. Um, there's a doctor who kind of coined the term and it was a Croatian guy named Csikszent Mihalyi. Don't even try to spell it, it's, it's tough. Um, but basically, you need to challenge yourself constantly, but you need to perform high levels of skill constantly over a period of time in years and days and months to get to that point. The goal here is to basically get to autopilot. When cutters came out for myself and the other guys, they came out seamlessly. We knew exactly what we had to do with them. Um, you need to train for success, but also experience some failure. Um, you need to be intrinsically motivated to do these things. And um, you need to have a feeling of control. As soon as you start getting to that point to where you feel like you're losing control, your confidence is gonna to start to drop. So these are all things that need to happen when you hit that flow state. And over time, that should be an eventual goal. So when you are in that bad situation, it feels seamless and you're super confident, which just breeds more confidence. Uh, moving on, one of the programs that we have here in the county is the IF uh, Fireground Survival Program. <clears throat> and it was fantastic because it's not only teaching you the skills, but it's getting everybody from the communication center involved, our command officers involved. We start to realize what the expectations are of if a firefighter is in a bad situation, what can command expect that firefighter to do so that he can better deploy resources and vice versa. Um, how do we put ourselves in positions just to prevent the mayday in general? You know, things like reading smoke, knowing what building construction is going to do and how we're going to be able to respond to that and what the fire is going to do to change our conditions and our practices and strategy. Um, and then once you are in a bad situation, if you weren't able to avoid it, how do you get yourself out of that? So once we get there, these are a lot of the skills that we're going through. And it, we still use that crawl, walk, run methodology. So over time, we start without, at the beginning, we're in PPE, but we're not taking our vision away. We don't have bottles on. And then as we start to build these sets and reps, then we can throw the bottle on, then we can breathe air, then we can take vision away. Then we can get away from the props and we can actually bail out of a two-story hose tower or the fire tower and actually go through these skills and actually experience it. Because again, just like I've talked about with all these other training concepts is the first time you should experience it should not be on the fire ground in a real situation. It should happen prior to that. And having that little bit of struggle is okay and it's gonna breed more confidence. So we're gonna work up from that zero visibility, go into real speed, and uh, go through all this. And maybe you don't have access to IFF Fireground Survival Programs. There's a lot of subject matter experts, I'm sure, in your own departments that have a passion for this. You know, seek them out. If you don't have that person, use a third-party training company. The resources are out there. You know, just start going through that. Um, you don't have to have the IFF program to kind of overcome some of these obstacles. All right, physical wellness is something that's very near and dear to me. Um, stronger people are harder to kill and are more useful in general. Like, you can't deny that. Right, especially with our job, we're occupational athletes and we have to kind of conduct ourselves as such. So I've had people tell me that, no, 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 I don't need to do this training or I don't need to work out because my adrenaline will get me through whatever scenario I'm about to go through. And when 50% of our line of duty deaths are cardiac related, that excuse to me is null and void. The adrenaline dump that you're gonna experience in a bad situation is gonna be the thing that puts you into cardiac arrest potentially, and now you're a liability to me and to everybody else around. So we're supposed to affect a rescue or maybe save one of our own. Now we also have to worry about you. Um, or maybe I work more efficiently because I'm more experienced. I got more time in. And you might be a 30-year firefighter that has done nothing to keep up with their skills because our skills are perishable. These are things that have to be kept up with. Just like any sport or like learning a language, you have to keep up with these skills or you lose it. So if you're the 30-year person who's you know, going to retire in a year and you've been sitting on the couch, 
you are still no good to me because you have not kept up with those skills. So again, 50% of our line of duty deaths are cardiac related. Um, and the workouts that we need to have happen in the, or excuse me, in the firehouse and on your own time need to replicate what we're actually doing out in the field. So if you're a bodybuilder, that's also awesome. you have a great strength foundation. Or if you're somebody who really likes marathons, that's great too. You have a fantastic cardio base. But if you're not trying to complete a lot of work very quickly in a stressful situation, and that could be moving large loads very quickly, it could be just managing your body weight, doing gymnastics type stuff, you're going to be a liability because you're specializing. And our goal here is to not specialize and to get as much fitness concepts into one area as we possibly can. And I'm going to show you the effectiveness of that. So again, here is a um, SCBA air consumption chart from Project Mayday. I uh, don't know who this person is, doesn't matter. Uh, but what we're showing here is a firefighter who was in a Mayday uh, situation themselves. So the first eight minutes of their air consumption is typical work performed on the fire ground, you know, pulling hose lines, doing searches with their tools. They've used up 50% of their air cylinder in that first 80 minutes. That's that first green drop, and it's a pretty steady drop. Pay attention to that. The collapse of a floor occurs eight minutes into this firefighter using air. They use up the remaining 50% of their air cylinder in three minutes. So they empty their entire air cylinder in 11 minutes. And you can see that very steady drop. And this is very common, talking to uh, BA techs and representatives from BA companies, this is pretty common. This is not out of the ordinary for the fire service, but I think we can do better. Moving on, this is an air consumption chart from one of the first in units at Woodscape. Now, one of the things I wanna point out again, this is absolutely reminiscent of what we see in the fire service talking to BA techs. The cylinder was on for about 42 minutes. There was a couple minute break and about three quarters of the way through, this person actually changed out cylinders and got a new one. So that's where that break is in the middle. Now you'll notice here, that every time they were asked to do something, if they were tasked with something to accomplish, there's a noticeable drop in air and there's a obvious demand in air consumption. So that could be pulling hoses, that can be forcing doors, that can be doing searches, coming in, coming out. Every time they're required to do something, there's a noticeable drop in air. Now moving on, <clears throat> this is my chart on the left and this is firefighter Andy Hoffman's on the right. Um, I've been a CrossFit instructor for 10 years, and I've been doing it even longer than that. And our shift had been doing those high intensity interval training type workouts in the firehouse for the year leading up to this situation, to, uh, leading up to the Woodscape call. What you'll notice for mine on the left, that first noticeable drop in air right here, this first drop, that's where I thought I was originally going to go in through side alpha. I was told, hey, no, hold up, stand by. That second drop is when I thought we were gonna go into the writ operation, but we were held up by Charlie Command to say, hey, no, hold on, we need to get these PAR reports and get a count of everybody. And then for both of us, you'll notice a nice, clean, 45 degree angle, steady drop. This is search. This is pulling hose lines. This is the entanglement scenario. This is working within 95% of my max capacity of dragging a down firefighter, dragging Lieutenant Flynn out of a high heat, low visibility, um, just super tight pathway in a crawl space and getting them out. So metabolically, I'm working at the absolute top tier of what I'm capable of. And for the next two weeks after, my, because of the adrenaline dump I experienced, I was no good for about two weeks because I was just utterly exhausted. But there's a nice clean drop of air. And this is what we should be aspiring to do. I don't mean to sit here and talk myself up or talk the men up, but they did a fantastic job. And if they were not physically prepared for what we had to do that night. There could have been firefighters that were stuck in that entanglement scenario and then their low order alarms went off. Maybe they couldn't gotten out of the structure. What if the space did collapse and we had to manage there, we had for the secondary RIT team to come in. So it's not just about us, it's about putting our other people around us in, in trouble. So we have to train in such a way that is reminiscent of what we do on the fire ground. Just doing strength or just doing cardio isn't gonna be enough. So here are some options that we have. Now, this is a cool chart because it kind of gives us an idea of how we need to be training. So there's a difference between anaerobic and aerobic. Aerobic is the oxygen driven energy system. So that's when you're pounding the pavement. I'm going to go for a jog. I'm just going to do, you know, a couple light push ups. I'm going to go for a walk. That's where 
aerobic is coming into play because oxygen is powering your workout. When we get into anaerobic, it's either sugar or naturally occurring phosphogen in the body is powering the workout. These are high power, but low duration. And you have to have little bits of rest in there to circle back and to be able to complete work. The neat thing about the high intensity exercise is that it trains anaerobic. Anaerobic can train aerobic, but aerobic cannot train anaerobic. So that's why marathon runners, they specialize in that. That's pretty much all they can do. But if you have somebody that trains anaerobically constantly, like the Olympic sprinter or like a world-class gymnast, they're working in things which are high power output. You can put that person into other sports and other domains and they're gonna do pretty well. Whereas the marathon runner can only specialize in that one thing. Or you have the bodybuilder. Um, I know a couple that they go up to get to the top of the steps and they're literally out of breath because of the way they train and the way they eat and they're specializing in that. So again, our fitness and our training needs to be broad, but it needs to be inclusive. And our goal, if we're gonna specialize in anything, specialize for the fire ground. You know, get in your gear, put on a weight vest. And if you don't have those tools, go outside and do deadlifts and then go run. Um, you can do sled swings on a tire and then work your core, do squats, do push-ups, do gymnastics, do weightlifting, do yoga, go run, and try to mix them up as much as possible. Now, there's something you can't see here. Um, that's the Z-axis. The Z-axis is your age. So 20-year-old Josh is going to be very different from 50-year-old Josh. But as you, get, uh, as you grow through your career and as you grow through life, you can absolutely still push the envelope of what you can physically do throughout your lifetime. So just because you're 70 years old doesn't mean you can't do this. I actually train everybody from the 18-year-old uh, lacrosse player who's going into college all the way up through uh, 70 and 80 year old grandmothers and everybody in between. So we need to preserve the stimulus of the workout, but we can scale back to meet their needs and meet their abilities. So I use the term scaling isn't sailing. You can scale back. So if I tell one person to do um, 300 pound deadlifts, you, maybe you can do 100 pound deadlifts. You know, let a good goal be work up towards your body weight in a deadlift and then maybe one and a half times your body weight because it's not just you that you're affecting, it's you plus your gear, plus your equipment, plus the down firefighter that's in front of you or plus the little girl that's stuck up on the second floor. So it's not just your weight and ability that you need to manage. This is a whole community expectation of the community and of the fire service. So we need to be able to push the envelope and have goals. And it's okay to start small and work up to it. Not everybody's there, but let this kind of hopefully reset your expectations and have some new goals in mind. Now here's some common examples. When you say high intensity exercise, like what actually is that? So over on the left, we see three rounds for time. So this is where I have basically set the work expectations and you need to complete that as fast as possible. Hey, there's a mother and her daughter stuck and trapped on the second floor. You have to go in and get them and get them out. And you have to deal with those lines. You have to deal with fire. You have to deal with the stress and weight of getting those people out. <clears throat> so that's where we have running. We are doing kettlebell swings. So that's where we're placing, um, we, we're working with a random kind of uneven object with the kettlebell, and then you're doing gymnastics. But you need to do that as fast as you can. You need to finish those three rounds as quickly as you can. In the middle is now we've set the time domain. So AMRAP means as many rounds of repetitions as possible. So one round is the pull-up, push-up, air squat. You need to be able to complete as many of those in 20 minutes as you can. That's like your air cylinder. That's a finite amount of air. You need to be able to complete as much work as you can with the air that you have. And on the right, filthy 50. If you can't handle the loading of that, so it's basically 50 reps of each thing, and you can't move on to the next task until you complete that one, which happens to us on the fire ground, you know, change the volume up. It can be a dirty 30. You can do 30 reps of everything. You can do 10 reps of everything. So you can scale to meet your needs, but these are some options. These are generally what um, some of these high intensity workouts look like. This is more reminiscent of what we do on the fire ground. It's not spending two hours doing back and buys, and it's not doing 20 minutes on a treadmill. Those things are important. We still have to do those things, but we need to mix them up and throw them into here, and you're gonna be more successful in the fire ground. All right, switching gears, we're getting on the back side of this, so just bear with me. Um, General Mattis, you can read the quote up here, but he's also said it elsewhere, where if you haven't read hundreds of books, you are functionally illiterate and you will be incompetent because your personal experiences alone aren't broad enough to sustain you. Um, I sat in the Andy Frederick's training days a couple years back with Chief uh, John Salka talking, 
and a young kid in the front raised his hand. And he said, hey, chief, you know, what books can I be reading to help me grow in the fire service? And the entire 300 person room just erupts in laughter because we're firefighters. We need to put our hands on stuff. We need to get there out there in the street. I thought it was super ironic because we're in a lecture class when this happened. Um, but I think General Mattis said it really well. I can live through other people's experiences. And that's, the simple answer for that could be NIOSH reports. It could be near miss reports. Um, we can actually put ourselves in the shoes of somebody else who's experienced something. So my experience, again, might be enough to sustain me. So I have to learn through those other people and we can design our training through that. Um, so a couple good books that I really like um, on combat. That's where I got some of the stress inoculation bit. Um, this is what's literally happening to you on a physiological level when you're in stressful life or death situations. And they talk about how to overcome that, how to deal with PTSD. It's catered more so to the military and police, but there are a ton of parallels that we can get for the fire service from this book. In extremist leadership is they follow, this gentleman follows teams that are in life or death situations, whether that's military, whether that's elite parachuting teams and they find out what leadership principles have to be in play for your teams to be successful in life or death situations. And one of the big things that I took out from that is competence. If you are competent in your skills and at your profession, it will breed trust and integrity with your team. If you, you can be the coolest person in the firehouse, you can have all the cool gear. If you can't hold up your expectation on the job, on the fire ground, people are not going to trust you because that's when the rubber really meets the road. So competence is huge. <clears throat> Deep survival is fantastic. It's quite literally who lives, who dies, and why. The first half of the book is very research heavy. I nerd out on that. I like that. I like knowing what's actually happening on the physiological level. The back half is also fantastic because it's giving stories and you're tracking people through actual real situations. All right, these person, or excuse me, this group of people are in a situation out in the middle of the ocean because their boat sank. These people die because they made these decisions and these people live because they made these decisions. And again, there are a ton of parallels that we can get for the fire service from these books. And the culture code's a really good one. It's just about tracking elite teams, whether it's sports teams, business organizations, and how you build them up on an interpersonal level. So you can be competent at your job and you can have all the great gear, you can have all the great training, but if you don't know how to meet the needs of your people, maybe things are happening outside the firehouse, um, how to build that trust among the group, you're still gonna fail. You have to have that trust, you have to have that respect, and it goes both ways. So this is a cool book for that. There's another good one, uh, Chop Wood, Carry Water by Josh Medcalf. It's about enjoying the process of becoming great, and constantly working. This is a constant process. Again, everything I've talked about, it's a perishable skill. So from year one to year 30, year 50, however long you're in this job, no matter what you do, you have to keep up with your skills. Um, podcasts, I know a lot of people in the fire service, you know, you may not be five minutes down the road from your firehouse. You might have a drive ahead of you, and that's a perfect opportunity to learn. There is so much free information out there that people are just giving away. You know, we should be taking advantage of that. Um, so podcasts, you can, you know, plug it into your headphones, plug it into your phone, your car, whatever, and just start listening. Um, and you can design your training around those things that you learn. Again, I can live kind of vicariously through other people and their experiences and coordinate my training around that. So situational awareness matters. It's fireground stories of near misses and how personnel can get into or out of those bad situations. I learned about uh, firefighters that recognize the signs of flashover and it saved their lives to get out. They were still injured, but they were able to get out. Um, another firefighter, was a, uh, uh, a garden apartment fire in Texas. The st whole stairway collapsed on top of them and sandwiched them, folded them in two, and they were stuck there burning until a cruise came to get them. You would never think about that, but it actually happened to somebody. So we can learn from their experiences. Uh, Jocko podcast, some people love them, some people are like, eh, it's not really my thing. It's a ton of military leadership, a lot of military history, um, but we can learn from military Medal of Honor recipients through military history. There's a ton of human element that's at play that we can glean from. And if for nothing else, you'll have military members that go through incredible, dangerous life or death scenarios. And the thing that got them out of a dark place was just being able to talk about it. And so our teams being in a rough scenario and experiencing a line of duty death, being able to talk about it and get it out and not go by that old mindset of, you know, we have to have this tough exterior. 
it's okay to have that shoulder to cry. It's okay to talk about it. And I think Jocko does a fantastic job of that. Uh, Leadership Under Fire, it's a uh, FDNY firefighter and former Marine. Uh, he brings on people like Navy SEALs and sports psychologists, sports players. Um, it could be firefighters from other departments, and we just learn from their field of expertise. And again, we can draw parallels and make ourselves better at our job. It's just, he, they've got great stuff. And they're not limited here. We have Fit to Fight Fire, Journeyman Firefighter, Team Never Quit, Engine Hose Training, Rit Nerds, Fire Engineering. I don't mean to leave anybody out, but there is so much free information. We, we need to benefit from them. Um, it's out there. It's, it's, it's all free. So, uh, wrapping things up. Treat every call as if it's real. Um, we need to experience the realism as much as we can. Um, we need to stress ourselves out as much as we can, both physically and emotionally. Again, we talked about the difference between adrenaline-induced response and physically-induced response, stress responses. It's okay to experience that stress. It's okay to experience struggle. Because again, the first time that you should experience something on the fire ground should not be on the fire ground. It should have been in training. And you'll be able to agree to overcome that. And then wellness, not just physical, but mental, emotional. Having that team concept at play is a huge in our role of success. Um, this is kind of just a, uh, the unofficial motto of seven. I stole this from uh, Patrick Lanciati, which is the author of Ideal Team Player. Um, we can be the best trained people. We can have all the best gear. We can have the greatest skills on the planet. But if we're not humble, we all know you could have one super arrogant person on that shift and they bring the entire shift down. So we need to stay humble. Hungry, we need to be passionate about this job. Every, so many people talk about motivation. There are plenty of times I'm not motivated to come into the firehouse and do training. You know, I have young kids, they could have worn me out the day before, but I need to be disciplined. I still need to have enough passion for this job where I maintain the discipline, you know what? No, I need to do the right thing for my shift, for my team, for my family, for the community. So I need to spend that hour of training. Like Celeste said, six minutes, become 1% better. Um, spend time doing that. And emotional intelligence, again, it kind of goes back to the humility side. If I don't know how to talk to my people and how to build the team up, and I'm just an arrogant, authoritative, excuse me, authoritarian uh, leader, I'm not going to build a healthy team concept where we can all work together and become stronger. So all these things are at play. Think about how this affects you, how it affects your department. Um, again, I'm just the spokesperson for Seven. The, these guys here, they have their own stories and they could go on for hours talking about their experiences in the firehouse on that call at home. Um, and I'm just a spokesperson for them. So I'm just, I'm just the one representative for these guys. Um, a ton of people helped me with this presentation. The department's been fantastic. We're making changes. We're becoming better. Um, I can't commend Celeste enough for her, not only her strength, but her support through all of this. And um, I just really appreciate everybody giving me this opportunity to speak. Um, if you have any questions for me, uh, my email is joshburchick at gmail.com. Just reach out to me. Um, it may take me a minute to get to you, but I've, I've responded to everybody I can. Um, we went through a rough experience. But I'm hoping that some people got some good messages and can learn from wh uh, what I've done and uh, what our team went through and what they accomplished. So there's a lot, of, uh, a lot to be gleaned here. And kind of wrapping things up a little bit, we also, some of the people out in the fire service, like, hey, we hear you're doing some training. What are some ideas of things that we can do? So we actually have a couple of videos that we're going to bring up of just a couple really simple ideas. Again. I'm kind of showing you the middle pieces of this, so you have to start with the foundations and build up to it. And there are a lot of things that we've done past what you're seeing in these videos to further stress our people out and to further accomplish like greater goals and a greater degree of uh, just stress and complexity. So um, these are just some examples that you can take back to your firehouse and we'll, we'll pull those up really quickly and get into it. With this training at Evolutions, we're trying to show the difference between exiting and abandoning a structure. With exiting a structure, that means that, hey, we're not making headway, we're not making the progress that we need to, or maybe the strategy has changed. So in that position, we need to grab our tools, we can grab our hand lines, and we can back out as we need to. For our department, when you hear the order abandon the structure, that means that something has happened or something is imminent is about to happen. In this instance, you're gonna leave everything in place and get out as fast as you possibly can. 
The first time you hear abandon the structure in a high stress IDLH environment should not be on the fire ground. So we need to start working those skills in, in a training environment. Command all units on the fire ground. Abandon the structure, abandon the structure. When the order is given to abandon the structure, they need to leave any tools that they have in place and as quickly as possible get out of the structure. In this evolution, we have multiple hand lines in place going to different areas of the structure. The blue line is going to an area that we do not want to send our personnel to. You'll notice that they are moving very quickly, but they're maintaining the orientation on the hose line. You'll notice that one firefighter picked up the hose line and dropped it on the ground. She's listening for the couplings to smack concrete to give an indication that she's coming up on lugs. When she does come up to the lugs and the coupling connection, they can do a quick read and make sure that they actually are going back out to the pump and making their way to safety. When they get to where multiple hose lines are crossing over each other, they're not just stepping over. They're sliding their hands underneath to make contact with their hands to absolutely ensure that they are on the right hose line and they don't step off and accidentally go onto another hose line that might send them into a bad area and a place they don't wanna be. This should be done quickly and efficiently. All right, awesome. Now we're gonna get into managing an obstruction in a hose line. In this training scenario, we're going to be pulling hose lines and we're going to be managing obstructions. When I usually set this scenario up for my firefighters, I want them to be managing turns and curves and have that be the focus of the drill. When the lineman is pulling the hose line, I don't want that person to get too far out in front and taking their turns too sharp so that way they pinch off the hose line. But we also don't want them going too wide around turns so that way we get it every inch as possible to the fire. I usually try to set it up to where they have multiple turns that they have to navigate, so that way that is the focus of the training scenario. They may not even know that an obstruction is coming. Once they actually get to the point to where they have an obstruction, then they have to realize it and go from there. the firefighters are flowing water, they begin to realize that they have an obstruction and there's there's an issue with the hose line. Some of the first things that we need to do is have them radio back to the pump operator that there's an issue and the backup firefighter is going to go around and they're going to chase kinks and see if there's anything caught on their tires, doors, or there's issues with couplings, maybe something burned through. Once they've figured out that there's no issue at the pump panel and that the hose line is secure, one of the last pieces we need to check is the nozzle. He's checking the flow and pattern, bleeding it out to make sure that any obstructions are flown out of the hose line, checks the nozzle, clears any obstructions, and then if you're in a condition where you can, you can put the nozzle back on. Obviously, in a low visibility IDLH environment, this is not recommended, and you can use a straight stream and continue fire suppression activities and just ditch the fog nozzle altogether. Hopefully one of the personnel might be carrying a smooth bore stack tip where you can put that on for a nicer stream. There's an obvious difference once the, once the obstruction is cleared that you have a nicer pattern. Two medical gloves. So to do that, we're going to take two medical gloves and put it into a third. We're going to knot it up. And what we're going to do is we're going to put it at the connection point for whatever line that you're going to use. So that could be right here. So this way the obstruction actually has time to make it all the way through the hose line once it gets charged. We're gonna simulate a catastrophic failure of the BA or a stuck MMR purge valve. We can attach line of duty deaths and near misses, one being in Philly and one being in Georgia where this training becomes relevant. What we first want to start doing is simulate uh, work being done prior to entering the structure. So we need to get our heart rate and breathing rates a little higher. By doing this, we're going to take off on a little jog out and back, and then we're going to do 10 push-ups. 
you can do anything. You can do sledge swings, you can be pulling hose, you can be running stairs, you can do lunges on a box, whatever is necessary. That's similar to the work that we're gonna do, but to get the heart rate and the breathing rate up. Once they complete whatever simulated work to get their heart and breathing rate up, then they're gonna crawl to the end of the nozzle to simulate that they're relieving the crew. Once they get to the end of the nozzle, they will begin flowing water with the high heart rate. You eventually want to work up to the point to where you can do this in full gear with zero visibility once they get on the hose line on air. Once they actually get to the end of the hose line, they will begin to flow water and you'll have one other firefighter make a predetermination of whose BA they want to shut down. Once that BA gets shut down, you'll hear the low air alarm go off and they need to recognize which firefighter that is. When that firefighter's BA gets shut down, they need to recognize which issue it actually is. And for this scenario, again, it's gonna be the MMR purge valve or catastrophic failure. In this scenario, this is where they're gonna to need to share their MMRs. By doing that, they need to recognize it, call out to each other with what remaining air they have left and be able to hold their breath with a high heart rate. Once they do that, the one firefighter with the air supply takes a breath, unclips, hands their MMR to the other person. The firefighter who's had the failure needs to take a deep breath, they need to unclip, and they need to be able to hand it back and forth. They keep cycling through this process a couple times and eventually get to the point to where they can work their way out of the structure while sharing an MMR. A couple quick points of performance with this evolution. You'll notice that when one firefighter hands off to the other, they're a little bit further down on the line. They're not holding the actual MMR itself. That's because when we hand off, we, will, we do not want two gloved hands fighting and fishing for the actual MMR. By holding a little bit further down on that line, it gives the firefighter who's receiving it time to grab it and clip in. Additionally, when you are not clipped into the MMR, you may want to start thinking about placing a gloved hand over top the opening of the mask so that way you're not breathing in products of combustion. As a final point of performance, you'll notice that the firefighters are always maintaining two to three points of contact with the hose line, a foot, a knee, and possibly a hand. Okay. So those are just a couple training ideas that you can take back to your departments. Obviously, modify it for your departments. Make it work for you. You know, change it up. You can grow from that. <clears throat> these are just some very quick ideas. Uh, at Seven, we've built on these and have incorporate a lot of different skills and a lot of different stressors into the environment. Now keep in mind this is shot for film, so um, it's not exactly as you may see it here. We, you know, we slowed it down. We wanted to really showcase some things. Um, but in the firehouse, we can try to make this as real as possible. Again, anytime we experience something, it should not be on the fire ground the first time. It should be in a training environment, work up to that point where you get stressed out. So again, I uh, welcome any questions or comments you guys may have. I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, thank you to Celeste for her support and for the, uh, the department for their support in bringing me on.